everybody. Welcome to our first bonus episode of MoCast. Uh, this week is awarding the Nobel Prize in um, Physiology and Medicine. And um, I'm super excited because the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize prizes that are awarded, it's kind of like our menu in competition, our Queen Elizabeth competition, our uh, international violin competition in Indianapolis. This is like the creme de la creme of the science community. This is the time where we can show off to the world um, how amazing it is to be scientists. And um, I, because the science server is having this month long celebration of the Nobel Prize winners and the research that they do, um, I figured that this week we could feature all the topics that are being awarded Nobel Prizes um, in mini episodes here on MoleCast. Uh, this does not disrupt our normal schedule of MoleCast. We will still have MoleCast episode 8 on Sunday, um, October 11th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But these mini episodes um, can get you caught up to speed on what's going on in the scientific community. Um, so very quickly, I'm just going to update everybody on how the Nobel Prizes are awarded. So in September 2019, Nomination forms were sent out by the Nobel Committee to 3,000 prominent academics um, in various fields such as physiology and medicine, physics, chemistry, literature, economics, and uh, the Peace Prize, which is actually sent to governments, uh, former Peace Prize laureates, and current or former members of the Norwegian uh, Nobel Committee. And these nomination forms are due back on January 31st, 2020. So if you can imagine the 2020 timeline, this was just as the pandemic was getting underway um, all across the globe. So the Nobel Committee, after receiving these nomination forms, then nominates 300 potential laureates. Um, these nominees are not publicly, publicly named, um, nor are they told that they're being considered for the prize. And fun fact, they don't unlock the names of those uh, nominees until 50 years after the prize is being awarded. So in the case of 2020, we will never know the nominees until the year 2070. Bummer, rip, uh, probably most of those people have passed on by that point, uh, but that's the way that the committee rolls. Uh, the selection of the laureates um, then comes down to that the Nobel Committee prepares a report which reflects the advice of experts in relative fields and uh, also presents a list of preliminary candidates. Um, and then the prize awarding institutions, which is usually um, the a Swiss bank that has the funds that were left behind by Alfred Nobel, um, receive the list and then choose the laureate or laureates by majority vote. And the guidelines are that you can not, uh, choose a maximum of three laureates and two different works. And um, the winners have to be alive. That's also a major uh, <laughs> consideration. You cannot be dead. And the awards are given to individuals, not institutions, except in the case of the Peace Prize. That can be given to institutions. So it's actually given to an individual for their work. Um, and, but the thing that really surprised me was that, um, the timeline of when, uh, work or research is considered for a Nobel Prize is different between fields. Um, in physics, chemistry, and medicine, uh, the achievement needs to be widely accepted and considered truth. Uh, before it could be nominated by a Nobel Prize. And this stemmed from the fact that, that somebody <laughs> a long time ago um, uh, was awarded a Nobel Prize for a potential uh, therapeutic for cancer, and then it was found out that actually that was a parasite. Bummer, rip, uh, but then the committee went back and decided that the achievement needs to be widely accepted so that mistake would not happen again. Um, the Nobel Prize in Literature is awarded usually to recognize a culminative body of work, something that has been uh, 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 gathered during a person's lifetime. And the Peace Prize, however, can be awarded for a lifetime body of work or a specific recent event. Um, there are many different examples of that um, throughout uh, the awarding of the Peace Prize. 
Um, after the prizes have been awarded, the ceremony is on December 10th, the date that Alfred Nobel passed away. Um, there's usually a banquet um, with many speeches and toasts. Uh, there's entertainment. Uh, Ray Chen played at the 2012 Nobel uh, Prize banquet, for example. Um, and then there's a lecture that usually follows afterwards. Because it is the year 2020, the banquet has been canceled. Um, I'm sure that in future years, um, they will invite the Nobel laureates, hopefully, um, to uh, a future banquet in order to partake in those celebrations. Um, so yeah, so that's just some background information on how the Nobel Prize was awarded. Today's prize that was awarded was, in the, uh, was for physiology and medicine. And uh, the winners this year are uh, two American scientists and a British scientist, uh, Dr. Harvey J. Alter, Dr. Charles M. Rice from the United States, and Dr. My Michael Houghton from uh, Great Britain. And they were awarded for the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. Um, and this is a bloodborne uh, virus, and it's the common cause of liver cancer. And this discovery of hepatitis C led to the development of blood tests for uh, screening for the virus and new antivirals that have been able to save millions of lives uh, from hepatitis C. So what is hepatitis? Uh, hepatitis is liver inflammation, which is mainly caused by viral infections. Um, but however, it can also be caused by alcohol abuse, uh, environmental toxins, and uh, autoimmune diseases. There are three different kinds of hepatitis viruses, uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Um, hepatitis A is usually ingested either from contaminated water, contaminated food, someone didn't wash their hands, um, and this can really develop within a matter of days to weeks. Um, symptoms include things such as fatigue, nausea, stomach pain, and jaundice. Um, and, but it still causes uh, liver damage. However, you can be vaccinated from hepatitis A. Hepatitis B is also a virus that you can be vaccinated against. Um, a lot of US uh, college students may have been offered an HBV vaccine before entering uh, undergraduate studies. However, unlike hepatitis A, hepatitis B, if you contract it, can cause months and years of um, cirrhosis of the liver and can lead into liver cancer. However, um, what was interesting about um, the discovery of hepatitis B by American physician um, Baruch Bloomberg was that he uh, realized that not all cases of um, cirrhosis of the liver and liver inflammation were caused by hepatitis B. So a uh, researcher, Dr. Alter, um, then uh, decided to uh, continue testing further to determine what was causing these additional cases of liver inflammation. And what he showed was that the illness could be transferred um, from humans to monkeys via plasma. And he uh, was able to show this uh, through multiple blood transfusions. So uh, from that work that he did, he was able to first identify that uh, liver inflammation was not only caused by hepatitis B, but another pathogen. But that pathogen would not get the name of hepatitis C until Dr. Houghton um, was, able, was able to successfully clone it in 1989. And what he did was um, hepatitis C is an RNA virus. Um, RNA is basically copies of a DNA strand. And some viruses, um, actually most viruses, are RNA viruses, which means uh, that in order for them to successfully replicate, they have to create a complementary DNA strand of their RNA template. We refer to this as cDNA. So what Dr. Houghton did was he actually made his own cDNA from viral RNA that he was able to isolate from infected animals. When he made this uh, complementary DNA, he then placed it into bacteria, and the bacteria were able to make more of this uh, virus using the complementary DNA. And then what he did was he added human antibodies that were able to recognize the virus. 
Um, and then from those human antibodies, he was able to genetically sequence uh, the complementary cDNA strand. This uh, type of molecular biology was the first time it has been used to identify a virus. Um, and oddly enough, this is the exact same blood test that we use today to screen for hepatitis C. And what Dr. Houghton found was that hepatitis C bleh, resembles viruses um, such as dengue virus, West Nile, and Zika. Um, these are also known as flaviviruses, uh, which was interesting because it showed that evolutionarily, hepatitis C is closer, closer related to flaviviruses um, than other viruses that, that we would think of. So um, Dr. Houghton and Dr. Alter um, were able to show that liver inflammation was caused by another type of hepatitis virus, uh, hepatitis C, and that you were able to screen for hepatitis C using a blood test. However, a final big question remained in the field, which was, does the virus alone cause um, liver inflammation and disease? Um, and this is where we introduce uh, Dr. Charles Rice. Um, he was able to clone the pathogen um, and inject the copies into animals. But what he found was that the virus was not able to replicate in those um, animals. So uh, what he did was that he analyzed the sequence and he found out that the sequence was actually mutated. So what he did was he went back and he repaired all the mutations that were made in that sequence. And once he repaired all of them, he found that the, the disease could actually be replicated into animals. So he was able to show that indeed the virus alone could cause liver inflammation um, into animals. Um, and what, from the discovery of not only these three men, but hundreds of other researchers that contributed to hepatitis C research, uh, they were able to show that first um, was that there's a great significance of long-term basic research questions. Um, Alter, Charles Rice, Dr. Houghton, um, they weren't really sure of what kind of pathogen that they would find, nor what would they would do once they found that pathogen. Um, in a sense of a timeline, it actually took 20 years to identify the hepatitis C virus. Once that virus is identified, it took another 50 years to find a cure. That's 70 years of hepatitis C research that went into getting the Nobel Prize in uh, physiology or medicine. Um, in addition to um, just the significance of their long-term basic research, um, they also now made blood transfusions completely safe. Um, before the discovery of the hepatitis C screening uh, test that we use today, blood transfusions were kind of a crap shot. You know, if you got a blood transfusion, there was actually a pretty good chance that you could end up getting hepatitis C. And hepatitis C could, you know, destroy your liver over a timeline of years. Um, so because of that test um, that Dr. Houghton de uh, developed um, and perfected, we can now safely do blood transfusions and new antiviral drugs were developed uh, during the discovery of hepatitis C. Some of those antiviral drugs um, are now used to help treat other viral diseases such as one that you might have heard in the news a lot, uh, remdesivir. That was actually a drug that was um, developed in, uh, to combat uh, hepatitis C, but now it's used to help combat COVID-19 cases. Um, and really, and this is in the words of the Nobel uh, Committee, this is a landmark achievement in our battle against viruses and uh, viral diseases. So where do we stand today um, in hepatitis C um, and hepatitis C research? Currently, there are 71 million people that are still infected with hepatitis C. They're primarily found in developing countries, um, and this is mainly due to contaminated equipment, childbirth, um, and sharing needles. Um, and there is still no vaccine available for uh, uh, hepatitis C. So a vaccine is still needed in order to combat this disease. 
However, what we do know is that um, anyone who does contract hepatitis C and is able to get the medication that they need, it's basically curable at this point. Um, it's just now the field is trying to get the necessary drugs into areas that aren't able to have those drugs. Um, and they're hoping that because of the awarding of the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine to hepatitis C research, that they're going to be able to get more exposure to developing countries that are unable to get that drug, which I think is a very uh, noble and um, great cause. <laughs> um, so uh, with this shortened uh, bonus mole cast episode, I also wanted to leave um, you guys with some quotes um, that were gathered. So what happens is, is that the uh, individuals that are awarded the Nobel Prize usually have to give multiple interviews. And if you're in the United States, that means you're usually being called around four or five in the morning and then you have to give a bunch of quotes. Um, so these are just a couple of quotes I wanted to leave uh, you, the audience, whether you're listening here on uh, the Molecast channel here at the Science Server, or if you're listening here on YouTube. Um, Dr. Charles Rice uh, said that the trick with science is to identify a question that intrigues you. And um, Dr. Alter said, with a persistent virus, persisting research paid off. Um, and something that I love to um, remind individuals who listen to the Molecast again and again and again is that classical music, just like science, requires um, not only a certain level of curiosity and intrigue and passion, but also persistence. Um, passion is important in science because without passion, you're not able to ask interesting, unique, and challenging questions that are able to um, help advance not only your field, but society in general. Um, that's a similar philosophy in classical music. Um, by not having that passion and that drive, you're unable to take the music to a place that not only uh, represents what the composer is feeling, but also represents uh, a new way or interpretation of that music. And as we all know, um, persistence is important uh, no matter what field you are in. Um, in science, as, as I told you guys earlier, it took 70 years, 70 years to <laughs> not only discover the hepatitis C uh, virus, but also develop a cure. Hopefully it does not take that long to find a cure for COVID. But what's important is that persistence pays off um, to not give up in the face of a challenge. Um, and that's the same with classical music. We will always encounter pieces, we'll always encounter etudes, technique, what have you, that's incredibly challenging. But by being persistent and not giving up in the face of that challenge, it will pay off for you in the end. Um, so again, even though all this week we'll be highlighting uh, the different fields and research uh, that help drive society forward, remember that maybe it's a little more sciencey than we're used to, but there's always connections back to the things that we love. Um, for me, there's always connections back to classical music, um, which is also another passion of mine and also a passion of yours. Um, and with that, um, just a reminder, uh, so this is the end of our mini mole cast bonus episode. Told you they were short. Um, <laughs> uh, tomorrow's prize is the Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, I am pretty jazzed about that. I know Justina is super excited about that. I can see her like freaking out in chat. Um, <laughs> um, again, come back here, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm so sorry, EU gang, um, for the timing. Don't blame me, blame Nobel Prize Committee. Um, if you uh, have any questions about um, any of the information that I provided in these mini Molecast episodes, please feel free to reach out on the science server. Uh, and we can't wait to see you on the next episode tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Bye.